Okay, so I think we're going to start now. Uh, today, welcome everybody. Today we're here with uh, Yossi Shane. And I'm going to I'm going to give an, a brief introduction to Yossi. Uh, before I do, so Yossi uh, will be speaking about the coronavirus and the Jews. And before I introduce um, Yossi to you, I just want to say that um, I would urge everybody to read the article that appeared last night in the Times of Israel that shows Roger Waters speaking to Hamas TV, uh, speaking literally about some of the most pernicious tropes of anti-Semitism uh, known, known to mankind. And it, it's, you could not have, uh, you know, I think Roger Waters has become a character out of a Howard Jacobson's novel or something, but you can see where the, the, our concerns about anti-Semitic tropes with the virus and the economic lockdown. Uh, we always were saying that viruses and Jews and anti-Semitism go hand in hand. You can see how the Nation of Islam, the BDS movement, and other actors are really painting Israel and the Jews in the most disgusting way. So I think Yossi's um, seminar today is really aptly timed. And these issues are going to become more and more, I think, of a problem or that we need to confront as a Jewish community, as scholars, and people concerned about democratic principles. Um, and we have to have a nuanced view of the struggle against racism in the United States, but how some are hijacking it with anti-Semitic tropes. So we need a sophistication analysis of the situation, which is rapidly changing and fluid, and to build uh, policy and responses to fighting racism, reaching out to the African-American community and fighting the racism, which is becoming more and more prevalent in this struggle. So on that note, uh, Professor Yossi Shane is with us today. He's speaking about the coronavirus and the Jews. Professor Shane is a professor of political science and, and he's also the head of the Abba Ibn program of diplomacy at Tel Aviv University. He's also the co-chair of the master's program in political leadership at Tel Aviv University. And he's a professor emeritus of government at Georgetown University. Yossi recently published a very important book entitled The Israeli Century and the Is Israelization of Judaism. It will be coming out soon in the United States. Um, Isaac Herzog, the head of the Jewish agency, called the book revolutionary and the most important book on the Jews and Israel in recent decades. Yossi Shane earned his PhD in political science with, with distinction from Yale University. He holds, uh, he has a dual academic career at Tel Aviv University and, and at Georgetown. Uh, at Georgetown, he was the professor of comparative government and diaspora politics, and he was the founding director of the program on Jewish civilization. So his, his work, he's well published, he appears all over the world in the media, and he's really a true leader on the issues of politics, Israel diaspora relations, and these changing dynamics. So it's really, and, and um, Yossi, in addition to all his work, is a regular contributor to the ISGAP Oxford summer program that we hold for trained professors on issues of anti-Semitism. So it's always a, uh, an honor and it's wonderful to be able to hear you again, Yossi. Thank you for taking your time and welcome to the, our, our webinar. Um, I'll open my uh, the camera and I wanna thank Charles. As you can see, I sit in my kitchen here <laughs> at home. Uh, Mike Lewitt, the Nobel laureate, who is in Tel Aviv also because of the corona, I met with him several times and he said, Corona make the people lazy. <laughs> um, I don't know if they make the people lazy, but certainly we live in a very, very awkward um, kind of world in that respect. We don't see each other. We don't uh, associate with each other in classrooms, but only over Zoom. Uh, but we hope that this will uh, change quite fast. Um, I've been in Tel Aviv during the coronavirus. In fact, I came back just on the eve of the uh, explosion of the coronavirus, and it was also the just uh, days before the Israeli third election the same year. Uh, I came from India, where I spoke also about diasporas and, and so on. 
And very quickly, I realized that um, it's an opportunity of sorts to understand um, what is happening here in terms of the Jewish condition. Not that the coronavirus just touched the Jews, of course, touched the entire world in many respects, but there are always specific questions which can be raised about the Jews in such an event. Charles mentioned one related to the question of plagues and the Jews and anti-Semitism, but I don't think this is the only one that is important. Perhaps there are even others which are more acute or more serious to ponder into the future. The first, of course, was the behavior of the state of Israel, where we have questions of sovereignty and legitimacy of the state and the democratic procedures um, were playing very quickly into the coronavirus because of the emergency powers which were uh, used by the government and also because of the fact that the government shut the borders of the state. This in and of itself made Israel the home of only Israelis and of only Israelis meant that Israel even went uh, to bring Israelis who were caught um, in other countries because of closures uh, and bring them home under the banner that here in Israel it's always the safest place where you are the best protected, almost kind of like um, uh, accentuating the Zionist vision of the supremacy of sovereignty. And indeed, as I will mention soon, this will become a very important factor in the entire way Israel have dealt with the corona. And since, and since Israel is now by now almost half of the world Jewry, and that's in and of itself an amazing phenomena of the 21st century, that the sovereign state of Israel is fast becoming the majority of the Jews around the world, also tells us that there is what, what, what Israel is doing is relevant to world Jewry at large. And that is, of course, when we take into account that the uh, amount of uh, casualties in Israel from the coronavirus was very small in comparison to the number of Jews um, losing their lives, especially in Britain and France and the United States, in other places, including even in Morocco and Sweden, etc., where we were working on the subject. In fact, while in Israel there are about 300 people dead by now, most of whom are people of old age, um, and many, uh, or, and almost half of them died in nursing home. Um, the number of Jews in the diaspora who uh, were uh, affected by the coronavirus and lost their lives, sadly so, is 30 times over. And this is for the same number of population, more or less. This in and of itself is an interesting issue. So let me say a few words about corona and the Jews and how I see it in terms of the question that must be raised. Uh, I just completed an essay on the subject which was sent for one of the British Journal, Journal of International Affairs for review. Hopefully they will take it, I don't know. Uh, but this is a massive kind of study to see how we can learn from this event and, what, uh, and, and, and where does it take us just to be, um, uh, 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 to be clear, this essay was also written with my very close friend and colleague, Daniel Goldman. So whatever is the essay and my thoughts are also shared with Mr. Goldman that deserves all the credit. And um, so let me put it this way. Uh, in my book, The Israeli Century and the Israelization of Judaism, I made the point that we are in this unique period where Israel is taking center stage of the Jew, for the Jews and the behavior of Israel and the condition of Israel as, leading, as, as the leader of the Jews, wherever they may be, notwithstanding whether you agree with Israel or not, but just the reality that the vast majority of, is, of Israelis will be, uh, of, of, of Jews will be in Israel and Israel is speaking for the Jews with some authority, is, is a mega shift from the Jews as a diaspora. And that kind of led me to, to think about for, as an epilogue for the, for the book, what will happen now in the corona? What we saw, and this is very quickly, quick point, is that the corona raised interesting issue about Israel's sovereignty. One is of course the criticism of Netanyahu and his government regarding how they treated the emergency powers um, to, in some people's mind too harshly 
or to subvert democratic processes. I don't want to get into the democratic uh, debate inside Israel. I don't think this is the place it's the room. But the fact that there were so many closures and there was sort of like an idea that people in Israel uh, were locked into their homes and the borders were, were locked only for Israelis to come back home made the point that Israel takes first and foremost care of its own citizens, notwithstanding whether they are Jews or Arabs. In fact, during the coronavirus, Israel found something very remarkable. And this is at the time of the third election, which brought kind of rupture between Arabs and Jews, that just because of the coronavirus, there was much greater cohesion because between Arabs and Jews, as Arabs also are 20 plus percent of the Israeli medical system. And they were all over the place treating coronavirus patients. And they were also being treated by the government in closures and other places, including military soldiers coming into Arab villages and serving food and helping the population. And this is at the time when the borders were locked for Jews from the diaspora who were suffering because of that. That was quite a remarkable thing. For people of the liberal, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, persuasions, who are oftentimes tell Israel because of the law of uh, uh, what we call the, 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 the national law, or because of the fact that Israel is a Jewish state, that we should be, liberal will always say, Israel should be much more open to all its citizens, the Arab. In fact, what we saw here, that the Arabs of Israel got a better treatment, quote unquote, than the Jews of the world. The Jews of the world were not allowed to come to Israel Israel considered their safety and their well-being in many ways secondary to the well-being of its own citizens. This just shows us our sovereignty and statehood is coming almost at the top of the agenda and it's always overwhelming or perhaps overshadowing the kinship ties between Israel and other Jews. In that respect, anti-Semitism, which was felt in the diaspora, and we'll talk about it before, was to some extent was not affecting the state of Israel which was acting as a sovereign, strong state, accentuating the, the, the idea that we are so strong. Inside the state of Israel, another issue needs to be addressed, and I was addressing it in my work, which is the role of the ultra-Orthodox. The ultra-Orthodox, which always question the sovereignty of the state of Israel, because they consider the state of Israel in and of itself almost a blasphemy, something which should not have existed as a secular state before the arrival of the Messiah. Suddenly the people of Bnei Brak and other cities who were not heeding to the warnings and were very, deep, were very deeply affected by it, would became the nemesis of many Israelis initially because many Israelis treated them and said, look at them, they do not obey the state and they are gonna spread the disease. This was creating inside Israel what Charles would call kind of like I would say, uh, 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 feelings of internal anti-Semitism against ultra-Orthodox. And even Benjamin Netanyahu was criticizing this vision because many Israelis said, look of the ultra-Orthodox, they are becoming infected. We do not have enough ventilators in the hospitals. They may take our own ventilators without producing them to the state, even though they are objecting to the state. This led to a revolution, no less, among ultra-Orthodox Jews including numerous papers, etc., of rabbinic and so on and so forth, which started to question their own behavior. Not only that, the fact that in Israel, the minister of health, himself an ultra-Orthodox, playing both as what we called a tenant and a landlord in the same state, was also putting tremendous pressure. How can you be part of the state and do not obey to the state? And eventually, the ultra-Orthodox not only obeyed to the state, but the army went into Bnei Brak, the army put in food, the army put of total closure and curfew on this. And that kind of like surprisingly brought the ultra-Orthodox closer to the state, appointing by themselves generals of the Israeli army to treat them, showing in fact that they are no longer are seeing themselves as sojourners in the state, but rather as part and parcel of the state. This is an interesting case. This will lead and already led to many questions of theology. What is the theological explanation to the disease? To what extent we should listen to authorities versus listening to rabbis? And who is the authority? To rupture within the community, 
All of these things will play out in the near future as we move on. In the diaspora, of course, the question became very much associated with the Jewish communities in Britain, in France, who were celebrating Purim and who were infected and who suffered devastating results because of that, but could not get the state to address them as Jews because they are just as the rest of the citizens. On the contrary, they were locked into themselves, could not even substantiate their communal life, not in terms of mikvaot, of, of bath, or, or opening schools, or, or synagogues, and all of the above. The, the very fact of keeping Jewish reli religious life or communal life became impossible. While in Israel, they were all kind of in the same boat of a nationalist attitude that allowed the nation to, substand, to supplement the religious groups. And that was an interesting development. The fact also that Jews had to contend with closing of institution without infrastructure was also very important yet to be studied. And that is something that needed to be addressed by rabbis, by, by communal leaders, what to be done, including the question of women's purity, mikvaot, all of these issues, lots of articles appeared. But let me go to Iskab's sort of mission, which is the notion of anti-Semitism. The fact is that Jews have always been associated with plagues, always been associated with people who are spreading diseases. And even now, there are lots of charges were made. They were made mainly against the Jews in the diaspora, albeit there were also charges that Israel was part of the conspiracy. But as one scholar wrote, these allegations of anti-Semitism were not so explosive as one could expect even. Some people even harken back to the black disease of the 14th century, where Jews were completely almost wiped out 200 communities because of attacks in Western Europe after, after Jews were blamed of spreading the disease. Keep in mind that Jews always have been blamed for spreading diseases. They were the ones who were blamed during the black disease and then they, and they were the ones who, 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 who always were blamed for being dirty Jews and they were the ones who were uh, for those who are, are poisoning wells. And of course, when it got to the Nazis, they were the parasites who are sitting, who are sickening, who are sitting on the soul of the folk of the, of the nation of Germany and therefore needs to be hygiened and gassed to death. That is, that's the thesis. Now, the anti-Semitic attacks as, as much as they were, uh, 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 um, uh, were, were, were alarming, became very quickly intertwined in other things which are happening, especially in the United States. Of course, anti-Semitism in the United States in the last few years didn't need the, the coronavirus. We had the right-wing attacks, we had the, the other attacks of the, uh, uh, of, of the extreme left and Islamic one, and we have BDS. But the coronavirus accentuated some of these issues in terms of the language, we saw it with Mayor Bellagio because of the lack of uh, 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 um, discipline among uh, religious or ultra-Orthodox Jews. The fact that they are living in incredible density, the fact that for them not to open the shuls or the, or the synagogues or the schools was unacceptable. These have led to lots of uh, 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 anti-Semitic tropes, as you said, Charles, and um, the, the big debate or the big question is how deep it runs, how much it basically um, uh, the st uh, stigmatized the Jews. And that is come on the hill of what happened in American streets. On American streets, when the, when the explosion came uh, during the corona with the uh, killing of the, um, Mr. George by a police officer and the whole explosion of anarchical nature erupted, the big question was where the Jews are in this business. To what extent the all Black Lives Matters uh, became, as in the words of some Jewish leaders, including the leader of the president of conference, that this is anti-Semitic tropes are being, are being used. I think that this issue has nothing to do with the coronavirus itself. It's something which is part of the uh, charges which are leveled against the Jews in among progressive uh, groups. Among non-progressive and right-wing, 
conspiracies of Jews were always there. So nothing in that respect was, was, was um, uh, uh, new. Uh, I think the only thing is that there were also some uh, conspiracy theories which were propagated, especially by Turkey and other, that to say that Israel is spreading the disease, that Israel and the Jews have intentions of saying that the Jews, they will, they will be the one who will benefit from it, as they said on Turkish television and so on. So uh, lots of things like that happened. I don't want to exaggerate them, nor do I want to minimize them, but yet, yet to be studied how much they really resonated or how much it is sort of like uh, uh, the uh, social media, which could be used very, as you know, on every issue uh, so um, cavalierly. Um, so in that respect, you can see that there are like several issues pertaining to the Jewish question, and I'll summarize them. One is, of course, the level of sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis Israelis. What does it mean, Israeli first? Is, is Israeli first comes at the expense of the diaspora? What about the kinship ties? Why Israel did not heed to diaspora uh, uh, the, the desires? Many people in the diaspora, rabbis, etc., said to Israel, you have deserted us. We have helped you all these years. Where have you been? And then, of course, inside Israel, there was the idea of the ultra-Orthodox. To what extent the, the level of uh, 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 I would say enmity, which was shown in Israel, vis-a-vis -vis the ultra-Orthodox, who did not heed initially to the state, was creating in and of itself sort of like a, a tropes of Israeli internal anti-Semitism, as people would say. And that is a very interesting case. And last but not least, of course, the issue of the anti-Semitism in the case of the diaspora. The diaspora, as we say, suffered several, uh, uh, especially religious communities. We have now about um, by numbers that we have in France and in England, uh, devastated communities that are now only now coming out of it, uh, leaders of the Consistoire uh, and others. Um, but we will see whether it has a lasting impact. And they also had to contend with the closures, etc., and with some of the stories of the past, how much it was the anti-Semitic old gene, or was it something which was passing because of some extremists in the media, yet to be seen, yet to be studied. And I trust that Charles, with his incredible team, will do a great job. I'll stop here for comments. Cool. So Yossi, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, you can hear me. Okay. I can barely hear you. OK, I'm going to speak loud. You know what? I'll shut my camera, and I'll try to hear you. OK. OK, so the, the question that I had, Yossi, Yossi, you can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. OK. So thank you for your, your analysis of the current situation. Given all the strains of anti-Semitism that you mentioned, so we have the, there's this time of COVID, we have right-wing anti-Semitism, left-wing anti-Semitism, intellectual anti-Semitism, political Islam, and now with this sort of, you know, as you said, this sort of anarchistic explosion of rage in the United States to the brutality, to police brutality, to the murder of of uh, George Floyd and, uh, and systemic racism becoming a very important issue in the American political discourse. Um, there's an element of this movement which is using anti-Semitism, it's, it's clear. Um, the Nation of Islam, the BDS movement, Students for Justice in Palestine, uh, the fact that Roger Waters, who has a lot of following, is on Hamas TV, you know, as a, almost as a, this horrible caricature, reciting the protocols of the elders of Zion, and it's becoming a mainstream narrative. So all this is happening. So I describe things that are happening that everybody knows. But my question is this, with sort of the global economic crisis that was developing before the virus, before the economic lockdown for COVID-19, but now with the economic crisis, we have at least 30 million Americans unemployed, um, the ripple effects of the, you know, the shutting down of the global economy has been profound, particularly on weaker societies. Do you, do you see the potential for significant rises in anti-Semitism and even instability emerging, or do you think that this will dissipate over time? And if this is Look, serious, what, what's, what's the role of Israel in, in all this? Do we, does Israel become the safe haven now? First of all, um, as I said, one has to make a distinction here.
because if, if as, as, as we say, more or less, the world, the world Jewry is now divided between the diaspora, which is now 54% or so, and Israel 50, uh, 46%, but more or less the same numbers, and especially in terms of like mobilization in the community. Um, the, the question that you're asking, Charles, as I said before, Israel is not, uh, one has to admit, Israelis do not concern about anti-Semitism. The thing that they are concerned about right now is to what extent if Netanyahu makes his move for annexation, how much this will bring um, a, a reaction and the enmity of the Arab world, of the, of the Western world, of the progressive forces, which are trying to tie together Black Lives Matter with Palestinian Lives Matter. I hear this, uh, this uh, slogans. Um, and so this is part of sort of like a, an Israeli-oriented anti-Semitism a la BDS, or what I call the Israeli component of anti-Semitism, which Israel was, is concerned about, but was not in terms of the anti-Semitic, uh, I would say, uh, uh, sensitivities of people who reside in France, in Britain, in the United States, in Canada, wherever. Because for, for the Jewish communities abroad, their vulnerabilities are not de derived from this Israeli behavior or not. Their vulnerabilities derive indeed from their unique lifestyle, let's say, of the ultra-Orthodox and how they are being perceived in the public. Who is propagating the idea that the Jews are uh, spreading a virus and their behavior is uh, dangerous to the public. They are concerned about the fact that um, others who are demonstrating uh, will see them as people who are not part and parcel of the liberal creed, even though Jews are part, so much part of the liberal creed, but the communal religious ones are not. So there's always kind of a debate within the Jewish communities themselves. Should we be universal or should we be particular? And the rivalry, as you very well know better than I do, is, is always within this community. Whether I see this as a source of explosion in France or in England, I don't think so because I don't think it's being waged from above. It's not something which is being sanctified or authorized or even uh, uh, accepted by the top uh, echelon of the society, but rather is being uh, negated and even um, protected and, and, and debunked. So I don't see this kind of de de development that you uh, suggest, notwithstanding, of course, that anti-Semitic attacks will continue because in times, dire times of, of economic crisis, of, um, of blaming the minority, et cetera, Jews are, have always been a good target. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have a bunch of questions that I'll, I'll present to you. Um, Dr. Colin uh, Lecce asks, um, he says, Black Lives Matter demonstrations in the United States included anti-Israel and anti-Semitic supporters. And he said, don't forget the same thing happened in Paris and London. Famously, I don't know if you saw the videos in Paris. Yes, yes. There were 15,000 yes. people and a large segment of the, of the crowd seemed to be screaming about dirty Jews. Um, the, similar things have happened in, in uh, London and even in Oxford. Um, so the question is, do you see, so going back, is this something that's gonna spread in the West? And I think maybe to add to Colin's question, I, I agree with you that it's not being sanctioned, but uh, Cynthia Ozick had a very interesting article in the Wall Street Journal last week, where she said mobs in themselves are not so dangerous, but mobs that are being sort of run by the intellectuals history shows are very, very concerning. And that the intellectuals have, not all, but in the, academic, in, the, in the terrain of academia, the demonization of Israel and Jewish peoplehood is quite widespread. So do you think that the mobs are kind of expressing outrage? Look, the there are lots of things, it are lots of things that are related. If you, take, if you take only American politics, American politics, as you very well know, um, have uh, it's, uh, the, the, the rupture in American politics between progressive and conservatives um, and the Trump administration and Trump himself has been incredible. And you and the United States uh, are in the midst of a huge culture war. And you ask yourself how Israel and the Jews are being entangled. 
To begin with, it's not their struggle, but the Jews have always been entangled. Why Jews also representing some liberal views, but Israel is the best friend of Donald Trump. And Israel is also seeking Donald Trump support for annexation and also seeking the support of the uh, evangelicals. And, and they see themselves as friends of Israel. As Trump said last year in the uh, convention in Miami of the, um, uh, what they call the Israeli Leadership Council, he said, many Jews in America don't love Israel enough. That's what he said. And indeed, many Israeli on the right consider their alliance not with liberal Jews. And they consider liberal Jews as not their friends because liberal Jews are friends of the uh, extreme in their mind, in their mind, uh, uh, forces of the progressives who are more keen to support Palestinians and even Hamas. So we are kind of in a conundrum in that respect. How right. do you, how, how do you, how do you uh, resolve it? I think that you see, for example, when it comes to the question of annexation in Netanyahu, that Israel has been warned by Joe Biden and now by three members of Senate, in, 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 including the best friends of uh, 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 Schumer and Cardin and Menendez, friends of Israel, and you see the enmity that grew between the Israeli right and the democratic liberal left. Since the democratic liberal left are considering Trump himself almost the enemy, and he considered them the enemy, the question that Israel is kind of like caught in between. And that is a dangerous place to be because the, 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 the Jews are always implicated when things like that happen. And that is in addition to many other things that we describe also about the, uh, the Jews uh, of the community, because liberal Jews are not Jews of the community. Among liberal Jews, the, 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 the disease didn't struck in the same intensity because they do not live in such dense communal uh, level. While the ultra-Orthodox Jews is a completely different story. It's a story related to the liberal condition, to the liberal state, to how much this minority contribute to us or how much this minority sees us only as a, a vehicle for their own interest. And, and, and Bougie Herzog that you mentioned that was so kind to my book also make the point that we are uh, likely to witness a massive migration of Jews from the diaspora to Israel. Um, we are all witnessing, let's see if this is really happening. It's too early to tell. Interesting. So, um, what, Yossi, are you able to turn on your camera or it's, it's not good? You lose yes. sound. So one of the, one of the follow-up questions I wanted to ask you, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, which you're an expert of, I was reminded of uh, Menachem Begin when he annexed the Golan Heights. He did it, uh, it was a surprise to many people, and he did it quite quickly. Netanyahu and the, the government seems to be taking a long time and seeing, testing that they're putting their toes in the water and testing people's reaction. So everybody kind of knows this may happen. So, and as you say, Israel is sort of stuck in the middle of the sort of political domestic politics of the United States. If, if there will, will be annexation, do you see this feeding into the unrest uh, in the United States? And does this, will this harm Israeli American and Israeli Jewish American relations? No. I don't think they like to compare 1981 to now. Um, it's almost 40 years. The Golan Heights was never a contested in the minds of hearts and Israelis. They always saw its part. It was not also populated. Uh, there was no question of boundaries there. There was only the enmity of the Syrian regime of um, Hafez al-Assad and later, of course, of Bashar al-Assad. So no one in Israel, you know, uh, saw it as a big deal in that respect. The West Bank or Judea and Samaria is heavily populated with Palestinians and lots of questions are raised. Are we going to annex them? Are we going to be what people charge? It's going to be apartheid. Are we going to leave some enclaves there? This is unsettled issue. And especially in light of the, 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 the Trump uh, plan, uh, the plan of the century, which became kind of like almost the, uh, the catch of, this of the century. It's kind of like a, almost a trap of the century. What to do? And the, and the plan of the century that Trump presented, 30% of the territory should be part of Israel. But he also talks about a Palestinian state and sovereignty. Many, many times it mentioned Palestinian sovereignty. 
none of the Israeli right-wing ministers are ready even to, to, to discuss it. The, the, plan, the, the argument has been that since Palestinians will not accept uh, uh, such a small state, let's annex and let's leave them there and so on. This creates tensions and this is something which is completely separate from the coronavirus. It comes on the top of things. It comes on the top of the Israeli uh, a, a endless almost political crisis until this government was built. Um, but I would separate the two issues. I really would separate the two issues. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't make the, the populist approach saying, you know, Begin did it in one day, why, you know, because it was a completely different, different story, the Golan Heights. And we saw when Donald Trump recognized the Golan Heights, you know, the world was quiet. You know, it's clear cut. Anyone who travels understand this small piece of land with some uh, Druze villages, but it's, uh, it's not the same. And even though we annexed it also, remember, in 1981, we continued to negotiate and almost gave it up in a peace deal with the Syrians in the 1990s until 2000. Uh, it was Hafez al-Assad was not ready to, give, to get back the land and sign with Israel. That was the, this acute mistake. But Israelis were ready to give it up, including Netanyahu, when he sent to Hafez al-Assad, Mr. Ron Lauder, who is now criticizing Israel for not being kind enough to the diaspora Jews during the coronavirus. Interesting. We have a, another question from Mehdi Ask Aria, and uh, he, he would like to ask you, he said, Yossi, could you, could, could you please elaborate on how anti-Semitism has demonstrated, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I'm listening to you because I can barely hear you if I don't listen. Okay, so Mehdi Askaria asks you, if you can elaborate how anti-Semitism has shown itself in the United Kingdom and France, excluding the radical fringes of society in the political spectrum, how do you see anti-Semitism, I guess, in the mainstream society of both France and the UK? Um, Look, in France, um, there was um, some outbursts, of course, because of the, um, the charges that the Jewish celebration of Purim and the communal celebrations and the fact that the Jews did not heed to separation or social distancing uh, spread the virus. Most of it in France, of course, came from really extreme uh, places. I don't think it was as acute I don't think that it was um, as uh, deep-seated in the sense that we have, of course, of the Islamic anti-Semitism, which is so prevalent in, in France. Uh, maybe it added in, in something, but I don't think as such. In Britain, of course, we see a shift, an interesting thing, because anti-Semitism has been uh, a major, major topic in Britain in the last few years, all the way to the defeat of Corbyn by, by Johnson which is the, 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 the Labour Party itself was blaming the Jews and the, the is in Israel for uh, 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 everything. And the, the tropes of anti-Semitism was blunt and they were, and they were uh, uh, aggressive. And many Jews and uh, all over the place were uh, even coalescing, thinking about the, the dread of the moment if Corbyn is coming to power, that British Jewry will have to leave. Something which will be, you know, going back to the days of, Cromwell. Uh, I think now things have been relaxed. And as, aside from charges which come through the social media and so on and so forth, I don't think you have seen any anti-Semitic waves, aside from expressions and violations and so on, that are a part of what we call day-to-day -day life. And, and Yossi, so now going to the United States, uh, you're an expert on, on the U.S. and U.S.-Israeli relations. Do you see anti the next wave of anti-Semitism potentially hitting the United States with kind of, I don't know, people from the streets, the intellectuals, and now there's also fears. Boaz Ganor has been writing about the rise of right-wing extremism and white supremacy. Do you see the U.S. as now going into a period that's difficult vis-a-vis -vis many issues, including anti-Semitism, or you think this will also kind of be relaxed? As I said, there are two components here. One, we have seen in the last few uh, months or years uh, with right-wing attacks in Pannonia, in, in Pennsylvania, in the synagogues, uh, in other places, and Jews have really had to shield themselves against this extreme right-wing. At the same time, on the left, Jews had to shield themselves against what we call the progressive wing, 
that basically debunk Israel as a racist state, uh, uh, talking about Israel and the Jews themselves as responsible for enslavement and apartheid and so on. This is an ongoing issue you have been dealing with, Charles, and so on. The big question that I would only add to that, or the big unknown factor, is the question now of annexation. And it will somewhat, if it's being executed next week or two, in the next two, three, two weeks, does it going to raise some question? Does it going to immediately raise uh, an explosion that will tie the campaign of the presidency to this issue of the West Bank? Will it get uh, the support of Trump and automatically will be BB and Trump in the same bed against the liberals? So the, the, the Israel is also against the blacks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, by extension. All of this yet to be seen. And there is a potential for a flaring of lots of charges. Um, does it take, does Israel take it into consideration? It does, but not in the same intensity one can imagine, because in Israel, lots of other things are being considered, including the position of the prime minister himself, his political future, his indictment in court, the, 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 uh, the setters, et cetera, et cetera. The diaspora is not being taken into consideration in a serious business, even though we have a lot of Okay, thank you. We have a, a question from Jeffrey Bernard, and he's asking, uh, he asks, Jeffrey Bernard is asking the ouster of Jeremy Corbyn has this really improved the uh, Labour Party vis-a-vis -vis anti Semitism and the Jews? Do you see significant changes in the Labour Party? I think that this is un unquestionable uh, that this has changed the atmospheres, started to clear the atmospheres, started to build a new zeitgeist, how it will happen, what will happen within the Labour. Uh, this was, was so toxic and so dangerous for British Jewry. And we heard what Rabbi Mervis' uh, statement and Rabbi Zach's and the, 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 the newspapers, the British newspapers, which uh, combined forces and came with almost like a, a, a universal plea uh, to defend jury against this kind of like blatant anti-Semitism of Corbyn. So I certainly see a new atmosphere being built, not just because of the love for the Jews, of course not. It's because the labor has reached such uh, uh, an abyss in terms of like its position, shameful positions, unacceptable positions, which basically did not resonate with the British public. Uh, and that kind of harmed them so badly, they were like completely decimated in the elections. And uh, so in some respect, the Jewish issue helped decimate them as they raised the Jewish issue to help them, it basically killed them. Do you see this uh, sort of political shift affecting um, academia? Do you think there's a shift among scholars? No. Or? No. I so don't think anything affects academia. Academia has its own language. We see the question of uh, what we call collective. But Yossi, we don't hear you so well. Ways of destroying the past because these are all evils. We see how they concoct the whole idea who perpetrated evil. And under this banner, Jews are always susceptible, notwithstanding the fact that they've been victims, but they were always also been described by left and right, especially the left, as sort of like joining evil, colonialism, the question of liberal and money, how much money they control. So this is something which always plays out into the hands and language of debunking the Jewish community. And Yossi, so do you, with this academic, with this reality in academia, and uh, the protests in the streets, and some of the discourse from the street, do you see this as potentially dangerous, or do you think this will pass? Look, uh, dangerous, of course. We don't like it. We'll see how things evolve. These are anarchic moments in America. Think about it. Uh, the protest against uh, 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 police brutality, notwithstanding, which everybody accepts. And the fact that racism should be completely wiped out from America, if it ever will be. Uh, but there is a moment of demonstration for human rights and black rights, etc., to anarchic moment of, of burning and looting that create anarchic moments in America. To that respect, the president and the right wing in America 
react with their own anarchic moment because they're saying that under the banner of rights, the left is perpetrating anarchy to unseat the president. So he will act anarchically with his supporters to uh, 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 undermine the counter forces. When anarchy is the spirit of the place and law and order is not respected and uh, the, uh, the bullies are in the street and the thugs are in the streets also and the demonstrators, Jews are vulnerable in that respect. Because slogans can happen, and, and, and my uh, stepdaughter in, the, in, in Chicago booth tells me that she was shocked to see that uh, uh, um, uh, slogans, which were almost Nazi-like slogans, uh, they were uh, labor liberates, um, and so on and so forth. So yes, there will always be extremists who will, who will use this thuggery, anti-Semitic uh, slogans. And you also, I think one last question, given, given Jewish American identities, it's plural, it's a pluralistic uh, community. So given the Jewish identities in the United States, do you think this moment will galvanize the Jewish community to have a stronger Jewish identity and a stronger identity with Israel? Or will this sort of speed up perhaps the assimilation process or the, the schism between Israel and American Jewry? It's hard for me to make prophecies or to say what will happen. Uh, America went through lots of upheavals and back and forth. And American Jews are very well settled in America. For them to take their uh, stuff and go, it's not, so, uh, it's not in the cards. And yet, um, the big question is what will happen to America? How America will recover from the economic downturn? How the culture war that is now uh, engulfing so many people will affect communities. It will be touching different communities. What will happen on campuses which are now completely locked? Um, or things will subside and we get into quote unquote normality until the next wave of sorts. Uh, I think it's too early to tell Charles. I don't want to make any predictions. Okay, but interesting times. <laughs> okay, so you'll see. So as I was saying, I'm glad you don't want to make predictions, but these are interesting times for uh, research and analysis. So, yes, absolutely. So, Yossi, thank you for taking your time and being with us today. I really appreciate it. And uh, Mazel Tov on your thank, new book. And I will see thank you, you so much for, for you, to the organization, to all your supporters, and uh, we are wishing for good days. Okay, amen. And I'll just say on a, on a closing note, on Wednesday at the same time, uh, we have... Uh, a very insightful scholar and intellectual. His name is Harris Rafiq. Harris is the uh, C CEO of the Quilliam Foundation, which is a, in a foundation, a think tank of Islamic or Muslim intellectuals dealing with policy issues, including anti-Semitism. And um, Harris Rafiq has been teaching on our summer programs and has been affiliated with this gap for many years. So it's gonna be a treat to hear him on Wednesday at 11 a.m. New York time. And his, he'll be speaking on Muslim uh, thinking and issues of anti-Semitism. So until then, everybody be safe and well, and thank you very much for joining us, and I hope to see you on Wednesday. And Yossi, thank you so much. All the best to you, bye-bye. Well, thank you.